So who are the main authorities you trust? The main authorities you trust in your life. I want you for yourself right now in your mind to come up with a list of uh, a few people, and I'm focusing on people for a reason. I'll make that explicit in just a second here. Come up with yourself in your mind of some people who are the authority sources for you in your life. And for the record, I'm specifying, think about people, because ultimately every book, news outlet, newspaper, magazine, YouTube channel, uh, every idea you come across was produced by (laughs) people. Ideas don't just come out of thin air, they come from people. And ideas are what make institutions happen. So we think of authority structures as things or institutions, and, and, and in a sense they are, but those are all nonetheless representative of people behind them. So again, take just a moment and I'll stop talking for a little bit. As hard, hard as that may be. Think for yourself of some of the people you would consider main authorities for your life. All right, I hope you have at least a few. And, and I'm not saying these people are authority systems and structures and sources for all the things you believe about God and, and everything that is real in life. I'm just saying who are some main authorities for your life? Spouse, a parent, grandparent, teacher, preacher, coach, preacher, author, preacher. Um, I want you to at least have a few people that you would consider your main authorities in life. So here's the next question. How often have you in life thought intentionally, carefully, methodically, systematically about the criteria for assigning the kind of weight and power to those people who you consider authority figures? How often in your life have you... I mean, because think about it, that's... That's important stuff to think about. (laughs) How often in your life have you intentionally, carefully, like put time, effort, weight into thinking about the criteria for assigning that kind of power and weight to these people, even if it's just few, to those people you consider authorities in your life? Is it because they're related to you? Maybe it's because they're trustworthy and they've borne out the values that they've communicated to you. Maybe it's because they're wise. This issue matters big time for us. And it's the kind of thing that you get some years on you and you realize, you know, I haven't really, I haven't really been very careful about these important things, about who I assign as a trustworthy source of an authority for me. Because here's the thing, y'all, every single one of us has those kinds of people or ideas or authorities or books or structures or institutions or news outlets. This issue of authority matters. It's big time. It's, it's, it's a really important thing. And it's been important in the Gospel of John that we've been studying in a whole number of ways. And we've seen this issue of authority come up numbers of times especially, as we'll see today again, especially with the Jewish leaders and the Pharisees. And the Jewish leaders and Pharisees who were testing Jesus, just like everyone around Jesus, were hearing his claims, were seeing his work, were watching his miracles, and they were all asking with very clear, intentional, systematic processes and thought, does he have the authority, is he trustworthy, to be an authority for the things he claims about himself, for the things he's doing. Now, so far in the Gospel of John, we've seen a lot of those things he's done. We've heard some of the things he's said and claims he's made. But this is a little bit different today because we're, in essence, we're taking a moment to say, let's think carefully about what Jesus is claiming. So far in the Gospel of John, the Jewish leaders and authorities have been wondering, who is this Jesus? And why is this John the Baptist guy who was a prophet out in the wilderness, why is he talking about him like this guy's the Messiah? Why does, why does this Jesus guy think he can just walk around speaking like a prophet 
and have disciples who follow him everywhere? And and what makes him think that he can just sort of waltz into our temple, traipse into our temple, and, and declare that he's going to destroy it and then raise it in three days? What's he even talking about? He walks around supposedly doing miracles. In fact, I've seen a few of them myself. It's pretty amazing. He walks around supposedly doing miracles, claiming to be the Messiah, the Son of God. And when he speaks, when he teaches, it's like he thinks every word from his mouth is authoritative in a way that we should actually believe his claims. Where does he get this authority? And most importantly for our passage today, though it sounds weird to say at first, where does he get the authority to do these things on the Sabbath? To many of us New Testament Christians today, to make an issue of the Sabbath seems like nitpicking. I don't think it is. And for them, it certainly wasn't nitpicking. It was a very important issue for them. It may sound strange to make this thing about working on the Sabbath, or as we'll see in just a second here, healing on the Sabbath. It may sound strange to us to make this particular issue an issue of authority, but this question of whether Jesus had this authority to do these things on the Sabbath was actually the crux of the matter for these Jewish leaders and the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who were trying to test Jesus and see if indeed he was who he claimed to be. And it actually wasn't even so much that he was saying the wrong things or or doing the wrong things, but that he was claiming something that they themselves knew. He was claiming something that, if it were true, would mean that he actually is the Son of God. He's the Messiah. And if untrue, it would mean he's committing blasphemy, and it must be punished, and we must do something about it. So they were just carrying out their duty to protect the law in their minds. They were just doing their duty. And so the the Jewish leaders wanted to press Jesus on this question in order to make clear that he knew that they knew that he was claiming to be Messiah. Open in your Bibles to the Gospel of John, verse 16. This is where we see this question of Sabbath authority come to the fore. It says this in verse 16, John 5. This was why the Jews were persecuting Jesus. Why? Why? Because he was doing these things. Remember last week we talked in John 5, Bob preached about how Jesus healed the man at the pool. And so that's what John is referring to here. He's referring back there. This was why the Jews were persecuting Jesus, because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. So if you've been following along with us during this series, you may remember that John, throughout his gospel, often refers to the Jewish leaders, the teachers of the law, the main Jewish teachers of the law, and the Pharisees. He refers to Jesus' main theological opponents by talking about them as the Jews. He uses that two-word phrase uh, almost 70 times in the gospel to, to say these are the people, this is the group of people that represent his opposition. And here at this point, the opposition starts to ramp up like crazy through about chapter 11, where very explicitly they begin to turn to the cross as their goal for Jesus. So John's reporting here in verse 16 that that Jesus was doing what they considered work on the Sabbath. And to heal, even though it's a good thing, was work. He was doing these things on the Sabbath, on a day that they thought you couldn't work. And they thought, and in very real ways they were right, about saying it is unlawful, it is not okay to work on the Sabbath. He was doing these things on the Sabbath, and that was for them an absolute scandal because not just that he was doing something on the Sabbath, but because he was claiming, I can do something on the Sabbath. It wasn't just that he was doing something on the Sabbath. It th- he was also claiming, I can do something on the Sabbath. And who can claim I can do something on the Sabbath but the one who gives the law, the one who says in the first place, remember the Sabbath, keep it holy. And that was a forever commandment for them. The only person who can say, I can do something on the Sabbath is God himself. And so that's what they were reading him as saying. That's what they were hearing him as saying 
to them. Not just, I, I did something on the Sabbath, and that's okay, but it's okay for me to do something on the Sabbath because, as we'll see here, he's claiming something way up there, and they, they knew it. He was claiming for himself that he was Lord of the Sabbath, and they understood it. They understood that that was his claim, which is why John says that's why they were persecuting him because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. Keep reading. He makes my point. Verse 17. But Jesus answered them, my father is working until now and I am working. Isn't that a kind of a weird thing to say in response <laughs> to them saying you shouldn't work on the Sabbath? Well, my father's working and I'm working. You're, you're, oh, you're, oh, your father's working. Therefore, you can work. This is what I mean. It's not just that he was doing something. It's that he was saying that it's okay for him to do something. He is saying he is Lord of the Sabbath. In essence, my father is working until now, and I am working. Those are fighting words for the Jewish teachers of the law. This was why the Jews were seeking, verse 18, this is why the Jews were seeking all the more, first time John makes this explicit in the gospel, to kill him. Because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but, ah, here we go. This is what I was saying. This is what he's saying. He was even calling God his own father making himself equal with God the Father. You're, yes, he is. Keep reading. Verses 19 and following. This is where 19 through 30, he makes six claims about himself as Lord of the Sabbath. Now, parenthetically, before we jump in real quick, in the three synoptic gospels, synoptic, S-Y-N, optic, meaning they Optics see sin together. They see things very similarly in terms of how Jesus' life happened chronologically, and they tell lots of the same details about his life, and they, they sort of tell the story in similar ways. But John, John's different, and I'm pointing that out because in all three of the synoptic gospels, they very explicitly say that Jesus himself said, I am Lord of the Sabbath. See, I'm not just making this up. The, the scriptures claim that Jesus claimed this. All three of the synoptics say that Jesus says, I am the Lord of the Sabbath. Now, it's not explicit in John, but the six claims that we'll see in 19 through 30 are Jesus explicitly saying, no, really, I am Lord of the Sabbath. It's okay for me to heal on the Sabbath. Why? Because I am, first claim of the six, I am equal with God. Look at verses 19 through 20. The first claim of the six, I am equal with God. So Jesus said to them, and this carries on from the previous scenario. Jesus said to them, truly, truly, this will happen twice in our passage. It's a rabbinical way of saying this is in keeping. What I'm about to say is in keeping with the law tradition. And so what I say carries the weight and the authority of God's words. It's a prophetic kind of thing. So Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the father doing. For whatever the Father does, the Son does likewise. Whatever the Father does, the Son does likewise. This is a claim to deity because Jesus is saying that his own authority is God's authority. If anybody talks like their human authority is God's authority, you should be skeptical. <laughs> He's saying his own authority is God's authority. If God does something, so do I. In fact, he covers every possibility in this by saying, the son does nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the father doing. He's saying, I do nothing that is outside of his will, nothing outside of it, and in fact, I only do what's inside of it. I only do what the Father does, and I do nothing outside of what the Father does. And they hear this, and they go, hmm, that's quite a claim. <laughs> that's quite a claim. He's saying, I'm equal with God the Father. Keep reading verse 20. For the Father loves the Son and shows him, key word in our passage, all. John uses this word all to say, it's not just in human terms and claims. This is bigger than that. 
For the Father loves the Son and shows Him not just some things that He is doing, but all that He Himself is doing. They considered the written law and the prophets and anything that was the interpretation of the Old Testament to be from God, some of it more authoritative than others, but even the Old Testament itself was not the fullness of God's revelation. They knew that it didn't say everything that is true about all reality, and so they considered, they considered most things being spoken on earth to be representative of the higher, greater, more important, infinite truth that comes from the Father. And so when he says, for the Father loves the Son and shows him all that he himself is doing, they're hearing Jesus go, hmm, y'all need to track with me. I'm talking about everything the Father does, I do. Not only that, but keep reading, greater works than these. You think, you think this thing at the, the pool with healing that guy that you're accusing me, but you think that was cool. Greater works than these will he show him. Will God the Father show the Son, and I will show you so that you may marvel. You think healing on the Sabbath is a big deal. You've not seen anything. You'll see something that comes from God the Father such that you may be amazed. Healing someone on the Sabbath, pretty cool, pretty cool. Supernatural, miraculous, comes from God. But they had a tradition, it was in the Old Testament, accounted for that, you know, sometimes God works through people doing things that we would all call miraculous. God, of course, was the effect of power. And healing someone on the Sabbath, eh, okay, it's cool. But Jesus is saying it's nothing compared to resurrection from the dead. Not just, not just of me, Jesus speaking, but of others. Of humans who are otherwise destined for eternal death and damnation. Without saying it explicitly, and he will soon, so far he's saying, that's a miracle. And that's what I'm going to make happen. Just keep watching. Just keep watching, he says. Second claim to be Lord of the Sabbath comes from John 5, 21, and then also verse 26. Jesus calls himself the giver of life. This is, this is where we start to hear Jesus say things. Remember at the very beginning of John, we talked about the idea that Jesus is a much bigger deal than we think he is. Because, because John says about Jesus, he, he's not just like, the Jesus who came in the manger. He's the Jesus who was present at creation and is creator. And all that we do and say and all of the stuff of life that moves does so because it's taken with him as sustainer. It happens because he still sustains creation. We talked about that at the beginning of John. Same kind of thing here where Jesus is starting to say things that are crazy radical. I am the giver of life is the next thing he says in verses 21 and 26. This is the second of the six claims. He says this, verse 21, for as the father, there's a lot of this, as he does, so do I. As the father raises the dead and gives them life. Now press pause real quick before we move on. As the Father raises the dead and gives them life, was something that all of the Jewish leaders would have agreed with. He's establishing at the beginning of his statement here, we agree, right, Jewish teachers of the law? The Father raises the dead and gives them life. And they would have said, yeah, of course. Yeah, there are a lot of scripture passages that talk about that. Deuteronomy 39, uh, 32, 39. Deuteronomy 32, 39 is a famous one where it talks about how God the Father alone gives and takes life. There are a number of passages that talk about that. We agree, Jesus. You're, you're, you're cool so far. For as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, but here's where it starts to take a turn, so also the Son. He's speaking about himself here. The Son gives life to whom he will. Just as God the Father gives and takes life, so also the, the Son gives life to whom he will. God the Father gives and takes life to whom he will, and the Son to whom he, he will, he will. All throughout this passage, there's this equating of what God the Father does and says with Jesus claims about himself what the Son does, what the Son says. 
For as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whom he will, which is an explicit claim of equality with God in power and authority. Jump down to verse 26 where he says the same thing, just a smidge differently. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted, gifted the Son also to have life in himself. Think about when Jesus had just approached the man at the pool earlier in chapter 5. If you want to read back there later on this week, in verse 6, John tells us that he approached of a multitude of people at the pool, some of whom, especially this guy that we know of, had been there for years. The tradition was the waters were stirred, something cool happens, and people are healed because of it. And this guy couldn't get in there, and so he he comes into the pool, and there's a whole multitude of them. And in verse 6 in chapter 5, John tells us it was because Jesus knew in a way that implies supernatural knowledge that was followed up by a question that was simply about prompting this man to say what he himself, Jesus, already knew he was going to say, namely that he had the power to supernaturally and miraculously heal this man's condition. So in other words, the way that John writes about what happened at the pool makes clear that when Jesus says, do you want to get healed? Do you want to get well? Jesus knew the answer. That's why he asked the question. He not only knew the answer was yes, but he asked it in knowing he himself would be able to supernaturally and miraculously heal. Why? Because, verses 21 and 26, think about how radical a claim this is. Jesus says, I raise the dead. I give them life. I give it to whom I will. Why? Because I have life in myself. Jesus doesn't just give life because he has life. He gives life because he is life. In a way that is, nerdy term, ontologically more important and truer than our brains can even remotely begin to fathom about what it means. This is a deep and a radical claim to be more than just a a prophet or a priest or a king in the old ways of, of the Jews thinking. He was saying, I'm Lord of the Sabbath because I'm equal with God the Father. And I know it. And I'm claiming it. And you're hearing me, Jewish leaders and teachers of the law who were hearing him, you're hearing me speak that claim and you understand what I'm saying. This was radical stuff for him to claim for himself. Okay, we have six and a half minutes left in this message and 10 billion verses to get to and lots of content that we won't, so let us boogie. Third claim. By boogie, I mean talk fast, not dancing. Don't worry. As if I'm not talking fast already. The third claim Jesus makes about being Lord of the Sabbath comes in verses 22 and 3, where he claims to be the final judge. He's saying, I am the final judge. Verses 22 say this, and 3, For the Father judges no one, but he's given, here's the word again, all judgment to the Son. Long story short, They believed, the Jews believed from their tradition, from the Old Testament law, from their understanding of how God worked, they believed that God delegated authority in some small ways in the here and now. But he doesn't delegate all judgment. No human can do that. (laughs) Which is why when he says that, and John reports this here, the Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son... For the Jews who had previously believed that God only delegates a smidge of judgment in small matters, to say that all judgment was given to the Son was a big claim. For the Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son, just as they honor the Father. There's that Son-Father equivalent again. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father Here's a, here's, here's a bit of a new idea. The Father who sent him. If it wasn't clear before, those listening to Jesus would have gone, oh, you are crazy. So he sent you. He, he sent you, and you're equal with him? And 
like you can give life? Hmm. To the whole world? Hmm. And whomever doesn't honor you, doesn't honor him? You crazy. At this point, though we don't have it reported to us by John, and, and there's no reason to think that they were actually picking up stones in physical terms, on the inside, these Jewish teachers of law were certainly doing so in their minds and hearts, thinking, it's, it's probably time to, to stone this dude. Because these are, these are hardcore crazy claims. Either he's actually that, and his life and witness, and the things he does the things he say, says, either those things bear out as true or we should kill this dude. Next three claims he makes real quickly. The fourth one is that he says, I will determine the eternal destiny of humanity. I will determine the eternal destiny of humanity. Look at verse 24. Truly, truly, I say to you, this is the second of, uh, I think, three times that we see this here. Truly, truly, I say to you, take this to the bank it fits with what God's said and what has been written by our forebears. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word, my word, Jesus speaking, and believes him who sent me, see how he's equating his words with God the Father who sent him. Whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. No human, according to Jewish tradition and law, gives eternal anything. <laughs> Humans are time-bound creatures. The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Humans are time-bound creatures. Only God, as he's spoken in the covenants, can say this is going to be a forever thing. This is another claim to deity. Whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. A fifth claim, which is another crazy claim, John 5, 25 through 9 I will raise the dead, Jesus says. I will raise the dead. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here because I'm here right with you right now. When the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. Those who hear my voice, because I'm the Son of God, who hear my voice and believe in it, and we're starting to see this idea of truth, uh, I'm sorry, trust and belief in Jesus' words as the distinguishing factor. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. As the Father, so the Son. As the Father, so the Son. So, he has given him authority to execute judgment. The Father has given the Son authority to execute judgment, which, by the way, according to uh, John 3, is a different kind of judgment. This is a John 9, 39 judgment that Jesus is speaking of here, the judgment that the coming of Jesus divides humanity into those who see him for who he is and those who don't, those who have belief in his claims and those who don't. I'm sorry, you're the unsaved people today. I will determine the eternal destiny of humanity, he says. I will raise the dead, John 5 through 29, which is why... Verse 28, you should not marvel at my claim, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out, those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. There are two resurrections, one to life and one to judgment. Last claim he makes is this, verse 30, I am always doing the will of God. I am always doing the will of God, which as soon as they hear him say this, <laughs> They go, this dude, he's making crazy claims. I can do nothing on my own, he says. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is just. He's making a claim that the things that he says, that his presence that divides, that who he is as the coming of the kingdom is just in a way that fits with the justice of God the Father. That's a claim to deity. As I hear, again, from the Father to the Son, as I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just because I seek not my own will, but the will, again, of him who sent me. Now, six claims he makes in verses 19 through 30. He claims, I'm Lord of the Sabbath. I can do that thing that you accuse me of not being able to do. 
not merely because it does actually accord with the law, but because I wrote the law, and I'm Lord of the law, and I'm Lord of the Sabbath. I am the Son of God, the Messiah that you seek. And belief in my six claims that I've just made that I'm Lord of the Sabbath, belief in those will be the difference. And he makes that argument in the next negative 45 seconds. He makes that argument that those listening to him, hearing his claims, the Jewish teachers of the law who accused him of doing wrong, he makes that claim and authority claim that if they would recognize the things he's saying about him, that they can have the eternal life that he grants. That they should recognize him for the claims he's making. Read quickly with me, 31 through 47. He's saying, I am not just saying this by myself, verse 31, if I alone bear witness about myself, my testimony is not true. He's making claims that extend beyond him. There is another who bears witness about me. He's referring to John the Baptist here. And I know that the testimony that he bears about me, the one who came before me, is true. You sent to John, meaning the Pharisees went to go check him out in the wilderness, which they did, and he has borne witness to the truth. So there's another witness to this truth of the claims I'm making. Not that the testimony that I receive is from man, not that I need to have it verified by a man, but I do say these things. I say these things so that you may be saved, which coming from someone who's claiming to be the Messiah, the Son of God, to make himself equal with God, speaking to teachers of the law who were expecting a Messiah, you, <laughs> you are hearing these things come from me so that you may believe in me. There's no question what he was claiming at this moment. I say these things so that you may be saved, so that you may believe in me. Keep reading verse 35 and following. He, this is John the Baptist, he was a burning and shining, shining lamp, and you were willing to rejoice for a while in his light. But the testimony that I have is greater than that of John. For the works that the Father has given me to accomplish, again, the claim to, to deity, what the Father does, so does the Son. The works that the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I am doing on the Sabbath, you accuse me of doing wrongly, which I am not because I'm Lord of it, and so I can do the good and right thing on the Sabbath. The Father who sent me has himself borne witness about me. Now listen to this speaking to the Jewish teachers of the law. His voice, God the Father's voice, you have never heard. His form you have never seen. And you do not have his word abiding and living in you. Why? For you do not believe the one whom he sent. It's as true today for us as it was for them. And so is this, Jesus speaking to the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you search the scriptures, which they knew. You search the scriptures, which some of us know. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is they that bear witness about me. Yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. I do not receive glory from people, but I know that you do not have the love of God within you. I've come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. John 1, 12. This whole thing about coming to those who were supposed to receive him, who claimed to be his children, who weren't, who apparently didn't have the love of God in them, who searched the Scriptures and still didn't see it, who did not have his word living in them. It's still as true today as it was then. It's still the issue. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, you'll receive him. How can you believe? Here's that issue. The dividing line is belief. How can you believe when you receive glory from one another and do not seek the glory that comes from the only God? Don't think that I will accuse you to the Father. There's one who's already accused you, Moses, on whom you've set your hope. You know the Scriptures. You know what Moses was saying, but you didn't believe what Moses is saying because you don't believe me. Verse 46, if you believed Moses you would believe me, for he was writing of me. The things that you know by heart 
that Moses wrote were about me, he says. But if you don't believe his writings, there's the belief thing. If you don't believe his writings as authoritative about their claims, how will you believe my words? What we need to ask ourselves today is whether or not those six claims Jesus makes are claims we believe. We need to know that Jesus is who he claims to be, and that's the dividing life, the dividing line for life and death, eternal life with, I'll, I'll make you all the life people and you all the death people at this point, the eternal life forever with God or not. This is the dividing line, these kinds of questions. Because, because if Jesus wasn't validly who he claimed to be, then what we're doing here is a total waste of our time. So do you believe, as he claimed, that he's equal with God? That he's the giver of life? That his coming is to execute judgment? That he will determine your eternal destiny? That he can raise the dead and that he's always doing God's will. If Jesus is who he claimed, if those six things he claimed about himself were true, then what that means is you have in him an intentional, systematic way of deciding whether or not his authority is worth giving your life to. Because if he's those things, he is the absolute Lord and authority over every nook and cranny of your life. And if he is those six things, belief in him is the dividing line. There are no other options about this guy. Either he heals this guy on the Sabbath because he's Lord of it, Or we have no hope in life. Because he's an authority who would bear out as a witness to the claims he's making such that his perfect, sinless life to the very end of his human days means that he was a sacrifice that actually works to save those who have belief in him. Let's pray, friends. Lord, we give you praise and glory for doing for us and for being for us far beyond our greatest thoughts and imaginations. Who could have ever written a story where you as perfect, sinless, holy God who created all that we know and who made us died for us, to save us, to be for us in the sacrificial lamb of your son Jesus and the regenerating work of your spirit in us, to be for us satisfaction we could never hope to have, to be for us perfection we could never possibly attain, to extend to us grace that saves, to be for us the truth that was borne out by the witness of the John the Baptists and the Peters and the Pauls and the people in our own lives who have faithfully pointed to you, not because of themselves, but because of you, because you are for us the giver of life. You are for us resurrection from the dead. You are for us everything we could possibly need, and we give you praise and thanks and glory. For you are Lord, and you are who you claim to be. May we live lives that bear witness to that truth. In the name of your Son, Jesus, we pray. Amen.